And for questions to the Minister of Education, and we'll start with listed questions. Questions 1, 8, 9 and 11 have been withdrawn. I call Mr William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number 2. Glenwood Primary School is one of the 22 new build projects announced in advance in planning in January 2013. As part of my recent decisions on Malvern Primary School, I asked the Education Authority to drop firm proposals for a wider area solution encompassing Edinburgh, Glenwood and Malvern Primary Schools. This will assist in giving clarity to the size of the Glenwood new build project. The uh, Education Authority Belfast Region is currently preparing the business case for the new Glenwood Primary School, which will justify the required size and consider a revised area solution. I call William Humphrey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister, I appreciate the work that the Minister has done in relation to schools in the Greater Shankill, not least Malvern, and I appreciate the decoupling of the Malvern and Glenwood schools. Can I ask the Minister, he will know that Glenwood is the hub school for Greater Shankill with more than 500 children, vitally important to the education of the young people in that area. Can I ask the Minister, because of its importance and the key role it plays, can he provide certainty to the school and his board of governors that the new bill will go ahead and will go, go ahead uh, as soon as is possible? I have no hesitation in doing so. I know there was some concern and perhaps confusion in relation to comments uh, around uh, the possible negative impact uh, on Glenwood if Malvern Street was kept open. And I know that caused concern uh, in both schools and indeed in the wider community. And I hope we have reassured the community now that that is not the case. This is a normal planning process we have to go through with every uh, building application. It is my intention to deliver uh, a new Glenwood primary school in the area, and my decision on Malvern Street uh, does not divert me from that. I call Katrina Rowan. Uh, question number three. On the 2nd of June uh, of this year, I approved the establishment of a new 26-place part-time nursery unit at AVA Primary School in Rathfreyland. This approval was in response to the publication in October 2014 by the then Southern Education Library Board of a developed proposal to establish the new provision with effect from the 1st of September 2015 or as soon as possible thereafter. The new uh, nursery unit will replace the current reception provision at the school. Having reviewed the advice from officials, I was satisfied that the evidence clearly demonstrated a need for more preschool places for the benefit of children in the Rathrailand area. It is well known that high quality preschool education has a positive long term impact on children's educational outcome. This new provision at IVA Primary School will help uh, achieve this aim in the Rathrailand area. Call Katrina Rowan for supplementary. Well, Gaon, and and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer and indeed for uh, appreciate the decision and I, I share his view in relation to the importance of early years. And I wonder uh, would he outline the rationale for modification of the implementation date for the new nursery to September 2016? Uh, thank the member for her questions and comments. The reason why we have modified it to September 15, 16, uh, the decision process. Um, it meant that my decision didn't come until the start of June. That meant that the preschool applications were quite well advanced for this year. So we felt it only right and proper that we had to delay the Rathfrayland decision until 15-16 to uh, not to interfere with this year's applications as we move forward, and also to ensure that we can put in place the infrastructure required in the school uh, for this this much welcome development at the school. Call Sean Rogers. Minister, and welcome the, that new nurse, nursery provision in the, in the Rafael area. But Minister, in terms of the flexibility around nursery education, um, have you given any consideration to perhaps, you know, that a, ch a child normally gets five three-hour sessions or whatever per week? Have you ever thought of introducing any flexibility where that might have been changed to three five-hour sessions? Well, we, we did carry out a review of, of preschool uh, education a number of years ago, and indeed we, we introduced our learning to learn policy within the last two years, and we now believe that we do have in place a policy which benefits the needs uh, of children. However, if there is imaginative proposals coming forward and, and they can be accommodated uh, within the infrastructure of the school, then I, I think each one is worth looking at, looking at on its own merits. David McNary is not in his place. I call Paul Gervin. Number five. New area planning governance 
structures are being implemented at a strategic working group on local level. These aim to improve the area planning process by refreshing and enhancing strategic direction and operational consistency across all education authority regions. They will also give opportunities for increased engagement with all key stakeholders and stakeholder bodies. Uh, the, area plan, the area plans for primary and post-primary schools are to be reviewed and consulted on by the Education Authority. They will then be published together for all regions by July 2016. The plans will be reviewed on a three-year cycle. The annual action plan will also accompany the area plan. This will reflect how the needs of all sectors will be provided for. It will highlight those schools exhibiting stress and indicate how they will support uh, how they will be supported and the sustainability the issues addressed. The first annual action plans are due to be submitted to my department in September this year. The annual area profiles, which contain information for 1415 on all schools in common and accessible format, have been published on the Education Authority's website. I have remained committed to area planning and I am confident that the new structures and processes I have described will lead to a more efficient and inclusive implementation process. I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, just in relation to uh, each sector, and I'm wondering what the criteria has it been applied fairly and equal, equally throughout all of the sectors of education that exist in Northern Ireland? Well, I believe so. Uh, all the main sectors are represented on one or other of the, the planning models. Each one's voice is heard. Uh, representations are made. Uh, from all the sectors, for instance, the new control sector bodies role has been recognised and they have been placed on the appropriate level uh, in relation to area planning, etc. So, I, area planning has uh, been an evolving process over this last number of years. Um, we had struggled against the backdrop of uncertainty around ESA and the continuation of the education boards. We now have the education authority in place. We have the control sector support body in place. So, there is certainty now on, on the way forward, and I think we can continue to achieve. Uh, significant goals through the area planning process, both in the short, medium, and long term. I call Pat Ramsey. Could I ask the minister why is there limited cross-border engagement when considering areas so close to the border, where it would clearly make sense that level of cooperation? Well, I, I think the impact of partition has had uh, clearly an impact in terms of how structures on both sides of the border plan and how uh, you think about how you deliver services. Uh, in a region, um, and that has had a negative impact, in my opinion. And there is further work to be done, and can be done through the education and area planning around cross-border cooperation. We're currently looking at a model uh, in Fermanagh uh, and Donegal to see how we can cooperate there. There's clearly areas in, in your own constituency where greater cooperation can take place. But it, it's breaking down. I'm not talking about the big political mindset, but politics with a small p. And breaking those down and ensuring that people, when they come to planning, that they look uh, both within this jurisdiction and beyond this jurisdiction to ensure that we provide the best services possible for all our young people. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Speaker. Um, does the Minister recognise that the Catholic Maintain Centre has, in fact, over many years reorganised their own school estate without um, reference whatsoever to other sectors? Does the Minister agree that we will not be able to have proper planning based, uh, area planning based uh, sectors until we agree a long term vision of actually having one single school estate? Well, um, the question then is what does that one single school estate look like? What does the managing body of that estate look like? Because we tried to bring in a model through the Education Skills Authority and it faced huge resistance. So it's making, and I'm not, the member's not the first person to make a statement saying, well, we need a single education system. Well, then that's a challenge for all politicians and educators. What does that system look like, and how does everybody, how do you ensure everybody has faith in it, and that the stakeholders all have a, a, a say in the development of education moving forward? That's a challenge for this assembly and for those beyond this assembly. But I don't think it's fair to criticise CCMS in isolation. Um, all sectors have been guilty at one time or another of planning their estate in isolation. I have now brought all sectors together under the one umbrella, where they have to engage with each other, discuss with, discuss with each other, and work with each other around planning future schools' estate. 
and I hope we also to bring forward shared education legislation to this Assembly, which I think will enhance the work of ensuring that sectors, communities and schools work together in the planning of our schools to state going into the future. I call Kieran McCarthy. Deputy Speaker, I can ask the Minister what procedures he has in place to ensure support for the growth of the integrated sector in the area-based planning process. Well, uh, the integrated sector have a seat uh, at the top table. They are represented in all layers of, in terms of area planning. They also have a responsibility to make their voices heard uh, and to engage with and encourage and facilitate uh, integrated education among the other sectors. I have made my views quite plain and clear to the body when I chair the meetings biannually. Uh, my Deputy Permanent Secretary chairs the other meetings. That all sectors need to work together and everyone's voice has to be heard, including the, the, the smaller sectors, the integrated and the Irish medium sector. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. When setting out the area-based plans, was the Minister mindful and indeed did he set aside finance to actually implement his plans, for example, of an amalgamation of a new school? Well, uh, yes. We, and area planning has been one of the central cores and policies of my department and indeed my time as Minister for Education. And if you look at the example even in terms of new builds, uh, amalgamations are, are given a, a score a higher score in terms of moving forward towards new build or investment in the school. So those, that, those elements are, taking, are taken under consideration in moving forward both in terms of capital and resource provision to uh, newly amalgamated schools. Though I do say again, it's a learning process. It's a learning process for the schools, for the sectors and for my department. But I think uh, we're improving on it and we're learning from the lessons that need to be learned from. Moving on, I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number six. Uh, I will start by pulling into context why the temporary variation process exists. Uh, the Education Order 1987 requires the Department to determine an enrolment number and an admissions number for each grant aided school. These numbers are set each year in consultation with the Education Authority, with the Schools Board of Governors, and with CCMS in the case of Catholic Maintain Schools. However, in recognition of the pressures that can arise in local areas, the Department has power to create additional places by the way of temporary variations uh, or TVs. And in fact, TVs are about addressing short term demographic pressures in an area. Additional spaces are sought and approved for specific named children on a school waiting list in an order dictated by the school's own admissions criteria. They are not about facilitating particular parental preferences or indeed about meeting the needs of a particular institution. The Department considers hundreds of TV requests each year. Where I am asked to consider a particular request, my overriding priority will always be with the educational interests of the Pacific children named in the request. I call Joanne Dobson. I thank the Minister for his answer, but does he understand why there is great concern that he saw fit to review and reverse the recent decision by his officials not to allow a temporary increase in year eight enrolments in a county Armagh maintained secondary school, but not to review the same decision in a neighbouring control school? And can he ensure this House and indeed the wider public that this is not a case of preferential treatment given the media comments by his party colleagues in the area? Um, firstly, before, before I, I answer the question, can I uh, offer my sympathies to Ms. Dobson and indeed to, on behalf of the death of, or in relation to the death of Councillor John Hanna? I pass on my sympathies to the Upper Man Officer Unionist Party, to John's wife, and to his wider family. I, I knew John, and he was a character, and he'll be sadly missed. Uh, by also, my sympathies to everyone involved. In relation to uh, the question, I can understand the concern because I believe that I have been misrepresented in the media, that uh, media and press releases have been inaccurate, unfactual, and have been, in some cases, in my opinion, deliberately misleading. I have set out quite clearly as to why I approved uh, the places in St Paul's, and there is a clear rationale behind that. And I have set out quite clearly where I torn down the places in Market Hill High School, and there is a clear rationale behind those as well. I do not focus my uh, work on the basis of orange and green. I focus my work on the basis of what the policy dictates and what the needs 
uh, of the children who apply and what impact that has on the wider area. We, we, we can concentrate on uh, well, I'm not going to get into a, a, a media fight over this. The facts speak for themselves, and if people deal with the facts, then there's a clear rationale. If people wish to play a spin around those, then I can't stop that. But if people sit down and look at the simple, simple facts of the case, they are defensible, they were the right decisions to make, and if I had to make the decisions in the morning again, I would, make, I would have made the same decisions or would make the same decisions. I call Robin Newton. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the Minister will be aware of the unique situation around Strandtown Primary School and indeed the three feeder schools of Belmont, Dundella and, and Greenwood, where temporary variation due to potential development plans needs to be uh, kept in place. Will the Minister to encourage uh, what are very good schools offering a very good educational base and indeed a very good social mix allow the temporary variations for the period of the development plan's implementation? Um, well, I, I, I consider each case on its own merits. Uh, and I, th there has been a number of temporary variations agreed in previous years, and I also believe for this year, for Strand Town as well. I would encourage everyone there involved in that equation to come forward with a development proposal which gives an area planning based an area planning proofed solution to uh, the Pacific Primary School nursery school relationship in that area. So I would encourage the Education Authority and the schools involved to come forward with a development proposal as quickly as possible. I call Rosie McCorley. My article asks can call your gascon based on Ira as Sir Agri Guji Shaw. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Can I ask the Minister uh, why is it not possible to grant every T V request submitted to the department by schools? The, the simple answer is that every temporary variation is different. It has different circumstances attached. And as in the case of a development proposal which gives a permanent increase to the number of the schools. It also has an impact on schools surrounding uh, the name school in relation to temporary variation. So it's impossible to give a blanket approval. As it's the same as it's impossible to give a blanket ban on any increase in numbers. So each case will be judged on its own merits. There will be occasions when I, as Minister, either uh, review decisions made by my officials or I am asked to review decisions made by my officials. And I will do that. And, um, I will decide, as, as the role of any minister in any department, that the minister's task is to govern and, and run their individual departments. At times, I will make a decision different from my officials, but that's the nature of government. That's the nature of being in a, a minister's post. And as long as I can stand over the decisions I have made, and I believe I can stand over the decisions I have made, even in the recent past, then uh, I'm content that the process has been followed out properly and fully. Moving on, I call Fra McCann. Carl, go round me, love Margaret. I'll ask Con Collier. Uh, Kesh, ever shocked? Question seven, please. Uh, go on, Boyer. Question of Valor and Kesh. The primary duty to safeguard pupils' lives with each school board of governors and schools are required to have in place policies regarding bullying and the safe use of the internet and digital technologies. D supports schools by providing through C2K safe and controlled internet access and ICT services. We also focus on teaching pupils of all ages about e-safety and acceptable online behaviour, so that even beyond the school gates and the boundaries of C2K, they are equipped to participate in the online world effectively, enjoyably and safely. C2K provides schools with access to e-safety information and teaching resources via dedicated e-safety zone. In May 2015, it ran e-safety conferences, attracting over 400 school representatives. All schools have received a new curricular containing information, advice and lesson plans on issues such as sexting, using webcams, social networking, inappropriate content and chatting with strangers. CTK works directly with pupils highlighting online safety issues and providing young people with links to relevant web resources. DE funds the local anti-bullying forum, which provides support, resources and guidance to schools, parents and pupils and we have tasked the Anti-Bullying Forum to enhance its cyberbullying resources during the year. Further specialist support is available for education authorities, child protection support services to schools, and children in post-primary education can use the independent counselling service for schools 
to speak to a trained councillor about any concerns or fears they have. I am currently taking forward new anti-bullying legislation, which will be accompanied by additional detailed guidance for schools, parents and pupils, and my department is working with the Safeguarding, Body, or Safeguarding Board in the development of its e-safety strategy. I call for Thank you. Uh, could the Minister outline the scope of his anti-bullying strategy? Or bill, sir? Well, in relation to the bill, I, I plan to give a legal definition uh, to, to bullying for the first time, uh, which will at this the proposal will be that bullying is the repeated and intentional use of physical, verbal, electronic, written or psychological acts or omissions or any combination thereof by one or more pupils against another pupil or group of pupils with the intention of causing hurt, harm, fear, distress or adversely affecting the rights or needs of that pupil or group of pupils. The legislation will also uh, put a duty on the Board of Governors to ensure that they have in place a robust uh, anti-bullying policy and that measures are taken to, uh, as much as possible as in any circumstances, that to eradicate bullying and support the victims of bullying. Uh, in, in our schools. In relation to e-safety and web, uh, internet safety, it will require a, a combined approach from a number of departments to bring forward legislation, if legislation was the right answer, uh, in regards to further e-safety for children. The, the Safety Board is working with departments and are bringing forward and have agreed terms of reference about bringing forward a strategy in relation to protecting our young people online, etc. So there's quite a significant amount of work going on across departments and interdepartment work around protecting our young people online. It's a very difficult uh, area, both for schools and parents, as the most recent tragic events have shown us that uh, criminals can reach young people from thousands of miles away. Uh, with disastrous impacts uh, on, on the children and on their families. So we will continue to work across a range of agencies and areas to do our best to protect our young people when they're online. I call Sandra Overend. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for that. And I know the Department of Education does do, carry a lot of work in the, in the realms of internet safety. Uh, can the Minister tell me if he has... Uh, if the Office of the First and the, the Deputy First Minister have shared with him the details of the, um, the gapping and mapping exercise that they carried out uh, in the winter of 2012, uh, completed in the summer of 2013, um, if, they, if they have given him any of the information from that gapping and mapping exercise, because I feel that it would be something that would really greatly benefit him, uh, or it should benefit him, um, the member and has would he endeavour to do so if he hasn't? Thank okay. you. Minister, um, I can neither confirm or deny uh, in, in relation to that matter, and I, I will ask my officials to further check if such information has been shared, and if it's not, can it be shared, and what, what help it will be to my department. Um, it, it may have been shared, and it may be part of the work of the safety board or the safeguarding board. Uh, I know they are involved in, in spearheading uh, work between the various departments moving forward and the agency, so I, I will endeavour to check that out and uh, to see if the information can be shared and what assistance it is to my department in our work in regards to uh, anti-bullying um, infrastructure. <coughs> I call Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the fact that the Minister is bringing forward legislation on uh, the bullying policies within schools. Would the Minister uh, agree with myself, though, that a lot of the cyberbullying in particular actually occurs outside of the school and, as the Minister has already mentioned, even on an international basis. So what um, has his department done in conjunction with liaising with the PSNI around this matter, as this has now become a priority matter for them and has been put into the new policing plan? The latest uh, circuit we issued to schools um, was in conjunction with and on advice from uh, the PSNI as well. Uh, and I know in, in terms of presentations which have taken place since the tragedy uh, in Tyrone that there, there has been joint presentations by C2K and the PSNI to schools and parents in the area which have been very informative and very useful. And we will continue to liaise with all agencies, the PSNI included, around how we protect our young people in school and outside school and how we provide information to teachers and parents and guardians on how they assist in protecting our, our, our young people. And also how we ensure that our young people 
and children feel comfortable with coming forward if they have made a mistake or are they are under uh, pressure from, from elements, whether they be bullies, criminals, whatever they may be, that we ensure that our young people and our children feel that they can come forward, discuss these matters with uh, a trusted adult, and that action can be taken, and that assistance can be given to, to, to young people moving forward. So that, that's the objectives of moving forward, and it will be multi-departmental, it will be multi-agency, and uh, I, I think the work that's going on to date has been very good, but we we'll are always learning. Sometimes in relation to the internet, there is always somebody one step ahead of you, so we have to keep learning and keep our ideas fresh as to how we do this. I call Dolores Kelly. And, uh, excuse me, can I ask members to take your seat? Thank you. Dolores Kelly. Thank you. Uh, uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, Minister, you will be aware that I have written to you recently in the aftermath of the tragedy, uh, and I would hope uh, that we could also promote the uh, website Get Safe Online as, as an information tool. But given that there has been uh, a death as a result of cyberbullying, has the Minister any plans to uh, have a critical in incident analysis in relation to, despite all of the safeguards and all of the policies and all of the procedures, somehow or other, uh, what was happening to Ronan? Uh, was not uh, brought to the attention of the school authorities uh, uh, and he did not know where to turn to for help? Well, um, I have I've responded to your letter I think, the last number of days, but I have responded and, and you will have the information uh, available to you. Uh, I, I do not want to get into the detail of, of Ronan's case or in relation to what the school did not know or, or did know or what the family knew or the police knew or whatever. I, I met with uh, the principal and vice principal and senior management team of the school yesterday in relation to ensuring that there was counselling services available over the summer holiday period for both parents and pupils. And I also wanted to ensure that the staff who, are, are, who have uh, acted tremendously uh, in the aftermath and in, in the run-up to this uh, in support of Ronan's family and of his school peers in supporting them, they also need support. And we have to ensure that we look after their mental health and well-being as well, because it's a very, very testing and trying period for everyone involved. In relation to a review of a critical incident, um, I, I have no difficulty in engaging or, or even suggesting to other departments and other agencies that we have a review. I'm not sure if this is the right time or not. I'm, I'm, it may well be the right time to do so uh, in relation to this, and we should learn lessons if lessons have to be learned uh, moving forward. In, in another term, another example I'd like to, like to share with the House is, in relation to counselling services, when there is a, a sudden death in a school, whether it be of a pupil or a staff member, the counselling service reacts immediately once notified, and they will send in counsellors into the school to be support the staff, to support pupils and parents. And that, has the, that happened in, in this case, as has happened in so many other cases. So the counselling service is there, but in, in the context of what, what you're saying, Mrs Kelly, I will certainly raise the issue with all the departments and see what was the best time uh, to carry out a, a critical incident review. I call Karen McKevitt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, question 10. Uh, I understand that as of the 22nd of June, 53 children have not yet been awarded a post-primary school place. With over 21,000 applications, this represents less than 0.3 per cent of the cohort. This is changing on a daily basis, and the Education Authority is actively working to ensure that all children are placed. The Education Authority has a statutory duty to secure provision of primary and secondary education, and the area planning process helps to ensure that there is a network of sustainable schools to cater for our children and young people now and in the future. The Education Authority and CCMS is the bodies with statutory responsibility for planning school provision in conjunction with uh, other sectors, including the integrated and Irish medium sectors, produced area plans which provide an indication of how the school's estate will meet the projected demands for places. It is the responsibility of the managing authorities and schools in the context of area planning to bring forward development proposals to make a significant change to the admissions and enrolment of schools. And uh, that is the end to list the questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Claire Sugden. Hey, speaker, how is the minister minimising the risk to 900 crash places due to the impending early years cuts? Well, uh, 
I, I, I've questioned this. We're now down to 900. Originally, I was being questioned over 2,400 places in relation to preschool. Uh, I, I have yet to see any figure in relation to this that I believe can be stood over. I do not believe that there is a risk to a significant number of preschool places. Uh, and I have already put on record that I have the finances to fund preschool places. The Early Years Fund is a different fund from preschool places. It supported community and voluntary providers who provided preschool places. But preschool funding is from a different budget and has not been affected. I call Claire Sugden for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I know the Minister has laboured what he believes early years to be and what it not to be. My sense is, is that he's just ignorant to the facts. So when is the Minister going to actually take responsibility for a fund that he currently has remit under? Over. Well, with the deepest respect to the member, if the member can produce for me a budget paper that shows that early years fund is not the preschool fund then I am ignorant to the facts. But I suspect there is one person in this room who is ignorant to the facts, and not you. Because Early Years Fund is a separate fund. You can mutter and interrupt me all you want, but if you listen, you might learn something. You'd be surprised you might learn something here. The Early Years Fund is a separate and distinct fund from the Preschool Education Fund. Can it was established. Through the chair, please? Sorry, Deputy Speaker. It was established in the early 2000s as a result of the ending of one of the peace funds. It was transferred from health to education, and education continued to pay out the fund. It was a budget of around $2.2 million, uh, and it was cut because of the drastic cuts we are facing as a result of the British government's economic policies. Preschool education is funded from a completely different budget line, which has not been cut. Well, we're still muttering, and we're still not learning anything. But I can assure the member, if she wants, I will send her a copy of all the budget lines within the Department of Education, and she will clear that, see there is a clear distinction between both. And I, if she has been listening to the lobby from the Early Years organisation, she will also know that they accept there are two distinct and clear budget lines in relation to this matter as well. I call Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister to inform the Assembly of any changes of the process for deciding on the, new school, on the new schools bill now that the five education and library boards have been subsumed by the Education Authority? Uh, no, there's no, no change uh, proposed or planned in relation as to how we uh, decide to provide new bills or the size of a school required in regards to new bills. I call Brenda Hale for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. And can the Minister provide details of the current prioritised list for schools waiting for departmental and ministerial approval for new school buildings? Um, we do not have a prioritised list in that sense. Um, I'm aware clearly that there are many, many schools out there uh, which require a new build, uh, which require significant investment, whether it's capital or a full new build through the school enhancement programme or through the minor works programme. But if we do come to a stage where we are deciding to make a new announcement, then we will contact uh, the relevant managing authorities and ask them to bring forward uh, a list of schools which they believe can be built within a timely time frame and which will fit in the whatever potential funding envelope we have going into the future. I call Adrian McCullen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can, uh, can I ask the Minister, in the recent answer to a question from me on early years funding, he told me it was his number one priority in the gym monitoring. Can you give us an update on that, please? Uh, it, it remains my number one priority. Uh, all departments have now submitted bids to the Department of Finance and Personnel, uh, and that will be processed through the normal ways. Um, and if and when uh, we ever reach a point where the budget bill is passed and June monitoring does arrive at the executive, I, I hope that. Um, the executive does agree to provide funding to the Early Years Fund. I call Adrian McCullen for supplementary. Um, when does the Minister expect that to be the case, that whenever the budget is passed and agreed and all the rest of it? Um, if, if I had the answer to that question, I would think I would be uh, doing a tour of, of the radio and TV studios, uh, telling everyone that the answer has been found to all our woes, but I, I don't have the answer. Um, I am aware that the budget bill is, processing, is progressing and I think its final stage is next week. I assume at some stage after that, June monitoring will be dealt with. 
call Ian Milne. Could I ask the Minister there how many teaching posts are being suppressed within this financial year as part of the voluntary exit scheme? Um, it's significantly less than first uh, estimated. Um, the Department has received 214 teaching redundancy applications, which means that boards of governors have identified 200 teaching positions as redundant. 80 of these 214 relate to development proposals that I have approved prior to the 31st of March 2015 and have been approved as part of the ELB education uh, had occurred costs in the 14-15 annual accounts, so they will be paid from those. The cost of the 80 approved redundancies is 3.1 million and the cost of the remaining 134 applications is uh, 4 million, uh, 4.7 million. I call Ian Milne. My good last young colleague, August um, Awakestown area Don Fregra, could you show? Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, with the reductions in the budgets over the over this last number of years, uh, how many teachers are in our schools currently, as opposed to uh, three years ago? Um, well, despite several years of significant teaching redundancies, our number of teachers has actually grown. And that's as a result of the number of pupils in primary school growing over this last number of years. So in the 2014-15 year, uh, we have an increase of 208 full-time equivalent teachers in the system. And over this last number of years, we have paid off quite a significant number of teachers. But uh, it's good to know that, in fact, we have 208 more teachers in the system than we had in the previous year. It's also worth, and I think it is worth noting, that. It is very difficult to judge the impact of a reduction in the Department of Education budget across um, 1,100 schools. And it was a fair estimate to suggest that there was around 500 teachers could, could be made redundant as a result of the cut to the Department of Education's budget. But the schools have reported back, and the, the redundancies we are looking at is 214, and they will be covered through the voluntary exit scheme, which I think is a very welcome development. Uh, indeed, we also estimate that the number of non-teaching staff that was suggested that might leave education around 1,000. That figure, as well, will be not necessary and will be significantly uh, reduced. I think we're dealing around now with school-based non-teaching redundancies is around 140. That number changes daily, uh, as well. So, though added to that at a later date will be the voluntary exit scheme of the Education Authority, as well. I call Pat Sheehan. Could I ask the Minister, in light of the Firm Foundations report launched by the PUP last week, could he tell us what his department is doing to tackle educational underachievement among working class uh, uh, children? Uh, the policy direction of my department over this last seven years, and previously during Mr McGuinness's uh, tenure, has been about tackling educational underachievement. We have tackled a myth that we had a world-class education system, and people used to tell us, if it's not broken, don't fix it. We've now got, I think, the majority of political parties to the point of saying, well, there is something broken. We may not agree on exactly what is broken, but they do agree now that greater focus has to be paid and given to uh, particularly uh, young people from socially deprived backgrounds. Uh, and we have put in place policies which are paying dividends. The latest examination results show uh, an increase in those achieving uh, five good GCSEs, including English and Maths. There is still a tale of underachievement, which we still have to tackle. But I believe the policies that are in place have the potential to turn things around significantly. I call Pat Sheehan. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. And I wonder, could he uh, tell us if the measures that uh, he and his department have been putting in place have shown any improvements in educational attainment? Uh, well, the simple answer is yes. Uh, and as I said during my original answer, uh, we're seeing around over a 4% increase in the number of young people achieving uh, good GCSEs, including English and Maths. We're also seeing, in terms of the provision of education in our primary schools, we have. This is an international report that shows that we have some of the best uh, primary schools in the English-speaking world. Now, that, that, that's something I think uh, our schools should be proud of, uh, the, those involved in education should be proud of, 
because the, the potential there is hugely significant for moving into our post-primary schools. We still face significant challenges in our post-primary school. Uh, and I welcome the fact that the, D, the PUP document has recognised uh, the challenge that academic selection has to education. And we often hear examples of, well, this child or that child done well if, if they come from a socially deprived background and academic selection done me great and all this stuff. But the system has to work for all the children in the system. And pointing to one or two examples of children who have done well and fair play to them is not good enough. We have to ensure that a system is in place to ensure that all our young people can achieve everything they can be. The, 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 the PUP report is, is useful for many elements, but it's useful for this. It has once again stirred up a debate about education. And I think debating education in the round is a very good thing. And I, I would encourage uh, that debate to continue. I call Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And my question was almost just asked there by Mr. Um, Sheehan. Can, can I ask the Minister to outline um, the main ways in which the money allocated to schools under the free school meal formula is actually spent? Uh, the, the, well, it's up to schools at the end of the day how they spend their investment. We have provided them with additional information in around the Sutton Toolkit, which gives examples of how uh, high performing schools in socially deprived areas invest additional resources and how they use them best for the improvement of educational outcomes for our young people. We have also made it clear to schools that we will be monitoring how that money is invested and we want to ensure that that investment sees a turnaround in the educational outcomes of the young people for which the money has been awarded to the school. It will take a number of years for that money to make a difference. It will take a number of years for the schools to be in a position to plan out and invest that money in a strategic long-term view. But I have no doubt that the money will make a difference. But money on its own is not the answer to the problem. Money is part of the answer. Strong le school leadership is crucial. Strong boards of governors is crucial. Parental involvement in education is crucial. And ensuring that parents who have had an edu a poor educational experience themselves have the confidence and the knowledge to become involved in their, in their children's education is crucial as well. And community and political support for schools is also crucial moving forward as well. So money is only one element of it. I was never of the view that uh, providing more money to socially deprived schools was the answer. I always said it was part of the answer. I call Judith Cochran for supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister um, for his response. Um, and I'm just wondering, does he believe that the free school meals um, percentage of school population thresholds actually allows the money um, to be targeted um, at the children it's designed to, given that that calculation means some schools with more pupils in free school meals are actually receiving less um, additional support um, than some of the smaller schools, and also whether or not there should be more of a focus on, the on that money being spent question, please. Um, to developing quality teaching? Well, uh, at the heart of the common funding formula debate, uh, which was around a year and a half ago or more, constantly commentators and other political parties challenged me on the free school meals entitlement formula, saying it did not cover or did not target properly the children who needed it. Now, a year and a half on, no one has come forward with an alternative. No one has come forward with an analysis that suggests that free school entitlement is the wrong way to identify social deprivation. Because I don't think you can come forward and prove that it's wrong. Because there is no, I'm not aware of any other social deprivation factor which identifies the individual person to which you give the money to. Because free school and meal entitlement identifies the child who's entitled to the benefit, and they're entitled to the benefit because they either come from a low paid family or a family who's on one or other benefits. So that far, that child is coming from a socio-economic deprived background. When you have significant numbers of children from socio-economic deprived backgrounds in one school, it then causes further uh, pressures on the educational attainment level and learning within that school. The money we have awarded to those schools is to tackle and challenge that uh, additional factor, in this, uh, or factor against learning. So again, I, I throw out the challenge. A year and a half on from the debate, when many commentators and many political parties told me free school meal entitlement was not the right way to do it, no one has come forward with the alternative. And that is the end of questions to the Minister of Education.